So I am Dr. Dan Scheinman, the Bird Conservation Director for Audubon, Arkansas, the State Office of the National Audubon Society, a nonprofit bird conservation organization. And I love birds. I love sharing what I know about birds. And today we're going to talk about how plants love birds. That's referred to as ornithophily. And there are many different types of plants all around the world that have independently evolved traits to attract birds as their primary pollinators. That term is ornithophily, which means love of birds. We are all ornithophilous because we all love birds. And indeed, it is a love triangle among a bird and two plants. The plants seduce the bird to visit them with sugar water, nectar. And the bird loves the plants for that sugar water. The plants love the birds for their pollination services. But it's thought that bird pollination evolved from insect pollinated features because insects have been around a lot longer than birds. So when flowering plants first evolved, <clears throat> they adapted to take on insects as their pollinators. And then when a, a bird came to a flower to eat the insects, well, if it got some of the pollen on it and then spread that pollen to another flower when it's going after insects, that's advantageous to the plant. So if the plant can start attracting birds as their pollinators, then it gets to spread its pollen around even more. And pretty soon we start seeing different plants that have evolved to become bird pollinated and in addition to or instead of being insect pollinated. And again, this has happened all around the world, many unrelated plants, but all probably started from plants that originally were insect pollinated. And there are a variety of bird species found around the world that are primarily nectivorous. They eat nectar as a big part of their diet. Of course, we all know the hummingbirds are nectivorous. They're found only in the New World, in North America, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And then in Africa, parts of Asia, the Australasian region, we have the sunbirds. They Kind of, kind of shape, they're, they're kind of shaped like hummingbirds. They come in bright colors like hummingbirds do, but unlike hummingbirds, they can't hover to feed. And then there are honey eaters that are found in the Australasian region. And, um, and these three families of birds are all unrelated to each other, but they all have a primarily nectivorous diet. Also, you'll notice that these primarily, primarily nectivorous birds, they are primarily restricted to tropical and subtropical locations, places where it's warm all year round, there's flowering plants all year round, the birds are permanent residents, and so these tight relationships have evolved between the birds and the plants. You don't really see bird pollination going on in more northern latitudes, like in uh, most of Europe and northern Asia. The one exception is North America, where we have hummingbirds, but those hummingbirds get around the problem of there not being some flowers during some part of the year by migrating south for the winter, where there is flowering plants around. Although birds also are pollinators in uh, places where there are not a lot of insects, like high elevations in mountains where it's cool, or real arid desert environments or remote islands where birds have managed to colonize but there are not a lot of insects. These are places where birds have become important pollinators of plants. And in fact, hummingbirds, their highest diversity is in the Andes in South America. But there are other groups of birds around the world that also include a lot of nectar in their diet. New World Orioles, Baltimore Orioles, Bullocks Orioles, they like getting nectar from flowers, although of course the flowers have to be bigger to accommodate the Oriole. 
In the tropics of Central and South America, there are the honey creepers that eat a lot of nectar. They're important pollinators. In Hawaii, we have the unrelated Hawaiian honey creepers, like the eevee, that feed on nectar. In South America, there are the aptly named sugar birds. And then there are the white eyes that are found all around Africa and Asia and the Australasian region. They're kind of like little warblers or vireos. They're their own family. A lot of them eat nectar as well. And then among the parrots, the lorikeets are unique in the fact that they eat nectar as well as a lot of pollen from plants. In order for a bird to eat nectar, that's primarily water, it has to have special adaptations to deal with that, especially in the tongue, because the tongue has to be able to capture that liquid diet. And hummingbirds, among all the birds, really have the most specialized tongue. First of all, of course, a hummingbird's tongue is really long, so it can reach deep down to that corolla and get the nectar that's down at the base of that flower tube. And a hummingbird's tongue actually wraps around the base of its skull in order to have more room inside of its head. And then what's really cool is that a hummingbird's tongue is actually forked at the tip has these projections called lamellae. So when a hummingbird sticks its tongue into nectar, the fork splits open, the lamellae unfurl, and then as the hummingbird takes its tongue out of the sugar water, the lamellae curl up again, the fork closes, and it essentially captures the sugar water in its tongue. And then when it brings its tongue back into its head, it pumps that sugar water back into its throat. And it does this at like a hundred times a second or something like that. One, in one tenth of one second, that whole open up, capture sugar water, close again takes place. So they are feeding very, very fast. And other nectivorous birds have adaptations to their tongue. There are some perching birds that have lamellae or filaments on the edge of their tongue to scoop up that sugar water. Parrots have real thick, fleshy tongues. So lorikeets, they have these thick projections on the tip of their tongue to help them dab up nectar and pollen. And then again, we go back to the honey eaters, the hummingbirds, and the sunbirds, three unrelated groups of birds found in different parts of the world, but they all have very similar adaptations to their digestive and excretory systems so that they can deal with that shared diet that is high in water, high in sugar, and low in protein. I'm not going to get into all those details there, but suffice to say, convergent evolution among these different groups of birds. And then the flowers themselves also have evolved adaptations to attract birds as their pollinators. And in some cases, not only to attract birds, but to avoid attracting bees that would be competitors to those birds. And I'll go through each one of these things. So first, of course, is the color. And birds have excellent color vision. And we tend to think of Hummingbird attracting flowers is being red. And yeah, red is really visible. Hummingbirds can see that. If a hummingbird is flying into a new area, it can look around, spot the red flowers, and go down and get its nectar. And if that is a successful strategy for one species of plant, then other species of plants can take advantage of that and also take on red flowers over time to attract those birds. But it's not only a bird attraction, it's also a bee avoidance mechanism because bees can't see red. Bees, when bees look at red flowers, to them it's green. So red, track birds, avoid bees. But it's not just red flowers that can be attractive to birds. We can also see flowers that are yellow and orange. 
or purple, violet, blue, or even white. On Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean, there are two flowering plants that are closely related to each other, and they both have white flowers. And each plant attracts a different species of white eye that's found on that island. And then what's more is that the two different flower species, their flower tubes are shaped differently and they're meant to fit the shape of the white eye that they want to attract, whether it's the gray white eye or the olive white eye. But these white eyes have learned to associate white with that nectar reward. And then in the tree fuchsia found in Australia, they do something totally different. When the tree fuchsia flower opens and it needs a bird to come along and pollinate it, the flower tips are green. Once the bird has come along, deposited some pollen on that flower and gotten the nectar reward, then the flower changes color and becomes red. So for the birds, green signals nectar, red signals no more nectar, don't bother with me. So it's kind of the opposite of what we think. But it all comes down to the fact that it doesn't matter what the color is, it's a matter of the bird learning to associate the color with the nectar reward. And then in some flowers, it's not the color of the corolla, the petals that matter, it's the color of the nectar that attracts the birds. And the aptly named Mauritian bloody bell flower has these red nectar globules at the base of the flower that's eye-catching for the birds and, and entices them to reach down in there. And then the type of nectar that flowers produce also influences whether they are attracting birds or bees. So for bird attracting flowers, they produce relatively high volumes of nectar because you know, birds are bigger bodied creatures than bees are and they need more of a nectar reward. So high volume nectar, but sugar water is energetically expensive for a plant to make. So it has a low concentration of sugar in that nectar, which is okay for birds. They don't mind that. For, for, um, for birds, so, so birds have to have a low concentration. Bees actually need a higher concentration of nectar because when a bee gathers nectar, it takes it back to its hive and then it has to use its wings to evaporate the water and concentrate that water, that, that uh, nectar, down to a, a more of a sugar solution. Uh, um, so for a bee, it's energetically expensive to deal with nectar that's low in sugar. It wants high sugar nectar. So the range for, there's a kind of an overlap area where both bees and birds like the nectar. That's kind of in the 20 to 26 percent concentration range. But then anything under 18% is no good for bees, solely meant for birds. And then high volume, low concentration leads to low viscosity, which makes it easier for the bird to suck up that nectar. And then the sugar type also matters as well. The flowers we have here in North America that our hummingbirds feed on, those offer sucrose-based nectar. And sucrose, that's the same sugar found in table sugar. That's what our hummingbirds eat. Now, that's also what bees like. So that's why we see a lot of flowers around here where both hummingbirds and bees can visit and pollinate those plants. But in other parts of the world where there are no hummingbirds, and instead it's the perching birds, the songbirds that are the pollinators, those plants offer those, that nectar that's composed of glucose and fructose, which are the sugars you find in fruit. So those plants are trying to appeal to those birds that also eat fruit and like that kind of sugar. But again, we have that bee avoidance mechanism because bees don't like glucose and fructose, they want just sucrose. And 
And then of course, there's the shape of the flower that helps to attract the birds. And we tend to think of bird attracting flowers as being tubular. And yeah, indeed they are. But here in North America, you look at a, uh, in the field guide at the plate of hummingbirds, you'll see they all have the same kind of bill. It's all short and straight. And the flowers that they pollinate around here also tend to have short, straight tubes. And that's because the birds and the plants, they're not around each other for most of the year. The plants are gone in the winter, the hummingbirds have migrated south, there's not a lot of time for these plants and birds to really strongly evolve together. And so each hummingbird species can visit a wide variety of flowers and different flowers can be visited by a wide variety of hummingbird species where you find a whole bunch of species of hummingbirds living in the same area. And then also a lot of our plants tend to be pollinated by both bees and birds and of course other insects too. But when you go down to the tropics where the birds are permanent residents, where the flowers or the trees, the plants are flowering year round, then you start to see some specialization happening. So for example, the datura flowers have these really long corollas and only one hummingbird can pollinate them. And that's the sword-billed hummingbird the second largest hummingbird in the world, and the bird with the longest bill in the world in proportion to its body length. And uh, this species is found in the Andes Mountains at high elevation, where there are not a lot of insects around to pollinate those plants. It's, what's interesting is when I was looking for photos of sword-billed hummingbirds, I noticed they all held their head up at an angle. And I bet that is for balance. They just can't hold their heads out straight because of that long bill. And even though they have a long bill, that does not stop them from visiting hummingbird feeders, but of course they, they can't perch and feed at the same time. And you think that the birds and the flowers would really get along and have an excellent, tight, mutualistic relationship. But actually, there's an evolutionary arms race going on. See, the, the bird wants its bill to fit perfectly into the flower tube because the better it fits, the more efficiently, the faster the bird can get that nectar out of the flower. But the plant, it wants a little bit of a mismatch in the shape of the flower versus the bird's bill. It wants that bird to struggle a little bit to get in and out, so it's more likely to get more pollen onto the bird's head or neck. So, the, in order to uh, better pollinate, there's pressure on the plant to evolve a more curved flower. That, in turn, puts pressure on the bird species to evolve a more curved bill over time which then leads to the flower becoming more curved, the bird's bill becoming more curved. And then over the yawns, before you know it, you've got this situation with the buff-tailed sickle bill and centropogon, both with extreme curvature, and both of them are stuck with each other. <laughs> they depend solely on each other for their pollination and their nectar. Now, of course, not all bird pollinated plants are tubular. Uh, there, there can be plants that are more um, brush shape, have more brush shaped flowers and those brush shaped flowers come in a cone or a sphere. You have the stamens that are protruding, the pollen placement is generalized and it, you know, it's not a specialized plant for birds because bees also can visit this type of flower. And these types of flowers are very common in Australia. And then plants evolve other traits to help birds be their pollinator. Now, of course, hummingbirds can hover. So a hummingbird can hover underneath a flower and get the nectar. But the perching birds, well, they've got a perch. So the plants are obliging and give them a perch. That may be a real stiff 
thickened flower stalk, like those blue-faced honey eaters are perched on. Or what's really cool is in the Babiana, found in Africa, that uh, thing you see that that sunbird is perched on, that is actually a flower. It's a sterile flower that grows into that long, stiffened uh, perch, specifically so the Malachite sunbird can grab onto it and then reach down and get the nectar and, of course, the pollen from the flower. Really cool adaptation. And you probably have seen other flowers like that. You may be familiar with the bird of paradise flower, real popular ornamental cut flower. That also has that real thickened fleshy base that lets a variety of birds perch on it and get the nectar. And in this case, you'll see that that flower is blue, as well as having yellow decor to attract the birds. But it's all about getting pollen somewhere on the bird's body to help spread it around. And in many flowering plants, that pollen is kind of uh, dusty and it sticks to the feathers of the bird. But in orchids that are ornithophilus, they actually, they have their pollen in a sticky little lump called a pollinarium. And when the hummingbird comes around to feed on that orchid, it gets that little lump stuck on its bill. In this photo, you can see that little yellow packet there. That is the pollinarium stuck to that bird's bill. Now, normally for bird pollinated orchids, that pollinarium is dark. So it blends in with the bill, so the bird is less likely to try to scrape it off. But of course, if I showed you a picture of a pollinarium that's dark, you wouldn't be able to see it. So I managed to find one where it's a light color pollinarium. So let's recap here, bee versus bird pollinated traits. So good example, on, uh, on, there's an island where you find these two species of plants that are closely related to each other. You've got Streptocarpus rexii and Streptocarpus dunii, found in the same area, related to each other, but totally different flowers in order to attract either bees or birds. Of course, Rexii is the bee pollinated one, Dunii is bird pollinated. For Rexii, it's got violet on its flowers. Bees see violet really well, it glows to them. Those violet lines, those are nectar guides directing the bee to go crawl into that flower tube. And it has that large protruding lip to act as a landing pad for the bee and then the bee can crawl into that open funnel to get the nectar. <clears throat> also notice that those flowers are single and they face different directions, which accommodates a bee's foraging style. You know how bees kind of buzz around here, buzz around there from flower to flower. Good for bees. <clears throat> Dunii, the bird pollinated plant, well, it's got red flowers. Birds see red, bees don't. It doesn't have nectar guides. Birds don't need that. It's got that giant leaf perch underneath the flowers and all those cylindrical curved flowers face that leaf perch and they're all clumped together. So a bird can perch on the leaf and then from one standing spot, stick its head into multiple flowers. But, like many things in nature, there are exceptions to the rule and there are animals that try to game the system. There are birds that try to get the nectar without getting pollen on them. A good example are the flower piercers. They pierce the base of the flower tube and get the nectar instead of sticking their head down that flower. Now you may think, well, shouldn't flowers evolve traits to prevent that? Well, yeah, many of them do. They have these thickened bases that are not easy to pierce. But as it turns out, when scientists started studying these things, they found that it's not necessarily bad news for the plant to have a nectar robber. 
So here's what's probably going on out there. <clears throat> so of course, a, a bird wants to visit as many flowers as it can, as quickly as it can, to get its fill of nectar. But a plant wants a bird to visit a variety of flowers on a variety of different plants so it can really spread that pollen around and get good cross-pollination. So when you add a nectar robber into the mix, well, some of that nectar is now gone. And you know, there's just a little bit of nectar in those flowers, and it, it takes time for a flower to refill its nectar content. So when there's a flower robber around, there's less nectar for the bird in any given area, and it forces the bird to visit more flowers and do more cross-pollinating, good for the plant. So <laughs> nature is complex and varied and always full of surprises. So what can we, what have we learned about bird pollinating plants that we can now apply to hummingbird feeding? Well, first of all, when it comes to hummingbirds, your sugar to water concentration should always be one to four. That's 20%. That's the same sugar water concentration found in nectar that the hummingbirds are getting from the flowers. And remember, think of your hand. Your thumb is the sugar, and your rest of your fingers are the water. One part sugar, four parts water. Always use regular plain old white table sugar. That's sucrose. That's what the hummingbirds eat. Don't use brown sugar. Don't use artificial sweeteners. Don't put honey in there. Just simple table sugar. Do change your feeders often especially in the heat because that sugar water can go bad and moldy and that's not good for the birds. The hotter it is, the, the more frequently you want to change it. And also, you always want to clean your feeders out completely before putting fresh sugar water in there. Don't put fresh sugar water into a feeder that has old sugar water in it. That is bad for the birds. And of course, we now know you don't need to put any food coloring into the sugar water. First of all, artificial coloring is bad for the birds and they just don't need it. Most feeders already come with red colored parts to attract the birds. And as you now know, it has nothing to do with the color. It's all about the association with a reward. And in fact, as some of you may already know from feeding hummingbirds, hummingbirds remember where feeders are. So when they first get back in migration to your area, they may go visit the spot where your feeder is supposed to be, reminding you it is time to put your feeders up. And in fact, God, I got to remember to put my feeder up. I just made my sugar water last night and I've got to get it out there now that it's cool. And of course, feeding hummingbirds with a feeder is just one part of maintaining a healthy habitat for hummers and other birds in your yard. And that includes native plants. Planting native plants is a great way to feed hummingbirds. Native plants have the, the nectar the hummingbirds need. And what's more important is that our native plants are hosting the native insects and the spiders that the hummingbirds need. Because that sugar water doesn't have protein Hummingbirds get their protein from insects, and they feed their young insects and spiders, not sugar water. And also, they line their nests with hummingbird uh, with a spider web. So, spiders, native insects are important, and you help promote those things by planting native plants. And now I appreciate everyone's time and attention, and I will go to the chat box and see if there are any questions. How often should sugar water be changed? Well, uh, every couple of days in really hot weather and at least once a week in cooler weather. And any time it looks like it's getting cloudy, change the water. When in doubt, change the water. 
And if you find that the hummingbirds are not emptying the feeders in a timely fashion, then just offer less sugar water. How do I recommend sanitizing feeders? I just use soap and water. It's, that's the safest thing. I just bring it in, clean it in the sink in soap and water. I might use a, uh, you know, a brush or one of those little um, you know, pipe cleaner type brushes you might use for a straw to get into the nooks and crannies. If I really want to sanitize something, then I'll use a weak vinegar solution. But personally, I don't like bleach. I don't use it. Bleach is poisonous to all life, so I don't have it in my home. What's the best location for a hummingbird feeder? Well, anywhere the hummingbirds can see it, really. Uh, somewhere where it's high enough that, say, a cat can't jump up and grab a bird. Somewhere where you can see it. You can see the feeder and watch the bird come out. And probably, uh, I would say, put it somewhat away from your seed feeders so the hummingbirds aren't put out by the songbirds. Do any other backyard birds need sugar water? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, Orioles like sugar water, and Orioles also will come for grape jelly and for oranges, and woodpeckers also really like sugar water. So I actually see a downy woodpecker on my hummingbird feeder on an occasional basis. And of course, humming uh, woodpeckers also have really long tongues, so they're able to get down in there and get that sugar water. Another frequently asked question that I get concerning feeding hummingbirds is, should you take the feeders down at the, uh, in the fall? And if you don't, will it keep the hummingbirds from migrating? And the answer to that is no. Keeping your hummingbird feeder up will not keep the birds from migrating because migration is ingrained in the bird. When the day length changes, their hormones are influenced and it causes them to want to migrate. And in fact, they really need that sugar resource to help fuel them on their long journeys. So keep your hummingbird feeders up uh, until you no longer see any birds for a week or two, then you can take them down. Is there a tray feeder for sugar water? Uh, I guess I would not necessarily recommend a tray feeder for sugar water because then that just makes it easier for bees and wasps to get at the sugar. Do hummingbirds ever eat bird seed? No, hummingbirds don't eat seed. They eat only nectar, insects, and spiders. Is it okay for a hummingbird feeder to be in full morning sun? Yeah, that's fine. Mine is in sun in the morning. I suppose a hummingbird feeder in the sun will certainly warm up quicker, so it will go bad faster, but if that's all you got, that's okay. Can you use unbleached table sugar? Uh, I, yeah, I suppose that is okay, as long as it's just plain old table sugar. You don't, just, as long as it hasn't been treated with anything. But most recommendations I see say use white table sugar. Raw sugar, can you use raw sugar? Uh, again, just use white table sugar. How fast does sugar water go bad in the sun? Depends on how hot it is too. It could be a couple of days or a few days. It just the hotter it is, the faster the sugar water will go bad. So keep an eye on it. Also, when it's in the sun, it'll evaporate faster too. So that's part of the equation. Are the Orioles here yet? Uh, yeah, there have been a few uh, Baltimore Orioles that have been seen in the state. It's a 
a little bit early for Orioles still. So uh, probably another week or so, and they will be here in numbers. They also make Oriole nectar feeders too. Oriole nectar sugar water feeders are bigger, they have bigger openings, and they have bigger perches for the Orioles. The sugar water change color if it's bad. It doesn't change color, but it gets cloudy. That's your signal that it's bad. And I think just to be safe, change it on a regular basis. And the higher it is, the more frequently you should change it. Is it bad to add ice cubes to hummingbird feeder that's in full morning sun? Uh, I don't think it would be bad. It would just dilute the sugar concentration, which for a hummingbird, is not a big deal because they can tolerate low concentration sugar, but um, that also is just a temporary solution because it's going to become room temperature and then hot pretty quickly out in the summertime. Do hummingbirds ever go into a bird bath? Uh, yes, they can. I don't know that they perch in a bird bath, but they may like zoom down and splash in it. But also hummingbirds like spraying water. So if you had a, like a sprinkler that was gently spraying water or a mister, hummingbirds will fly through that to cool off and take a bath. Good questions, people. <clears throat> Are mock mockingbirds nice to hummingbirds? Uh, well, mockingbirds are territorial. And they do tend to protect their food resources, but hummingbirds and mockingbirds do feed on different things. So I don't think there's too much competition there. If anything, it's the hummingbirds that are, that can be mean to other birds because hummingbirds really jealously guard their food patch, whether it's flowering plants or feeders, and they will fend off bigger birds to defend their limited resource. Any tips on adding a perch to a feeder? Well, of course, hummingbirds don't need a perch to feed. They can hover, but there are many feeders that come with perches built in, and I have one, and that's fine. It lets the woodpeckers feed as well. So whether it has a perch or not doesn't really matter too much. Do Orioles require a different sugar concentration? Not that I know of, at least around here, Orioles and hummingbirds can feed on some of the same flowers, and bees feed on those flowers too. Uh, and so one remind me there are, yeah, there are, um, if you want to keep squirrels off of your hummingbird feeders and raccoons, you do need to protect them. So you want to hang them someplace where those mammals can't get to them and keep a, a, a guard a predator guard over your hummingbird feeder so that those critters can't get onto them. Because if you've got your hummingbird feeder like on your back deck and a raccoon comes along, it can just spill the sugar water and drink right from the hummingbird feeder. So if you've got other pest animals, protect your feeders. And then also you can buy, if you've got ants that are a problem, you need an ant moat, which is just a cup you fill with water that hangs between the feeder and the hook. You can buy ant moats or you can make your own. But just be sure to keep those filled with water because those, of course, will evaporate over time and then they won't be useful anymore. And then I've also seen chickadees and other birds come and drink the water from the ant moat. Any other questions? And one other thing I'll mention is that you can leave your hummingbird feeder up all winter long because they're in the middle of October, after the ruby throated hummingbirds have migrated south, there are some Western species where individuals will move to the Eastern US and stay in the Eastern US all winter long. And if you have your hummingbird feeder up, there's a tiny chance 
that you will get one of those wintering hummingbirds and they may stick around and come to your feeder all winter long. And the closer you get to the Gulf Coast, the more of a phenomenon this is. All along the Gulf Coast, Mexico, there are hundreds and hundreds of hummingbirds that spend the winter. And the further north you go, the fewer there are. But here in Arkansas, every winter, we get small number of rufous hummingbirds, and then on a rare occasion, a whole bunch of other species are possible. Black chin, broad bill, broad tail, annas, calliope, many other birds. If you don't have your feeders up, you won't see them. But, it, uh, but again, it's a tiny chance. and You've got to commit to keeping your feeders full and ice free all winter long. <clears throat> see other questions do hummingbirds eat ants yeah i'm sure they would eat the ants that are coming to try to get the sugar water are there predators on hummingbirds other than cats well sure there are other birds that can catch hummingbirds and praying mantises bigger ones of course can also take out hummingbirds and then in other parts of the world there are big spiders that like to catch hummingbirds in their webs and eat them. Can you move the feeder so that uh, hummingbird will still find it? Well, if you, if you move your feeder's position, eventually, yeah. If a hummingbird is used to finding it in a certain spot, chances are it will still find your feeder in a new location. So if you're not satisfied with your feeder location, just go ahead and move it. And as long as the feeder is full and clean and has some red parts, the birds will find it. <clears throat> is, there, is there a way to attract a hummingbird if you don't have them around? Well, of course, uh, hummingbirds, when they're migrating, they occur in a wide variety of situations. They'll move all throughout our suburban and urban areas and you can live in the middle of a city and if you've got a hummingbird feeder on your uh, outside your window there's a chance a hummingbird might come and visit it. But to really have a hummingbird be in your yard all summer long you've got to have breeding habitat nearby and hummingbirds breed in forests. They nest on tree branches. So there's not a lot of trees around, you're not gonna have hummingbirds around. And the closer you live to the woods, the more likely you are to have breeding hummingbirds around you and have one or many hummingbirds come visit you all summer long. That's why when you go to state parks, you know, they're in more wilderness areas, their feeders tend to be chock full of hummingbirds. And you get home to the middle of Little Rock and you've got none. During migration, you see the peak, lots of birds moving through, all feeding. In the summertime, fewer birds because of habitat, but also because of territory too, right? Uh, a yard can support only so many hummingbirds, and one hummingbird is going to defend that yard as part of its territory and try to keep the other hummingbirds out if it can. I repeat the answer about the mockingbird, the mockingbird and the hummingbird. So I don't think mockingbirds and hummingbirds are going to really be competitors with each other because they eat different things. Mockingbirds like fruit and seed and suet. Hummingbirds are nectar and insects. Of course, mockingbirds eat insects, but um, they're not really competitors. But hummingbirds do tend to chase away any bird, even bigger birds, away from their food patches, whether it's flowers or feeders. Is there a way to keep the hummingbirds from fighting? It is, does seem silly. You get hummingbirds fighting over feeders when there seems to be plenty of food to go around, but that is just ingrained in their system, right? Flowers have only a tiny bit of nectar. It takes a lot of flowers to feed a hummingbird. It's what jealously guards its food. And they just haven't quite adapted to figure out that hummingbird feeders have plenty of food, so stop fighting, right? 
until you get to the situation where there's just so many hummingbirds around, they just can't compete with each other. So they just tend to live with each other and all feed as best they can. Uh, now, if you want to keep the birds from fighting with each other, the best thing to do is to spread your feeders out, especially keeping them on opposite sides of the house so the birds can't see each other and then they're not gonna fight so much. You can have multiple birds come and feed at the same time when they can't see each other. <clears throat> do hummingbirds mate for life? No, they certainly do not. In fact, hummingbirds are not even monogamous. The male and female mate, the male leaves, goes off to find another mate, and the female does all of the nest, nesting and chick rearing. And she tends to the chicks alone. And then the next year, they find different mates. They don't come back together again. And how many bird species mate for life? I don't know that off the top of my head, but monogamy is actually not as common as polygamy is in the bird world. In most species, multiple a male will mate with multiple females, or they will be serially monogamous. They may one male, one female for a season or for a clutch, and then they find different mates. What amount of nectar do hummingbirds eat on a daily basis? That I am not sure of. It, it is a lot. I mean, they can consume a lot more food proportionally in a day than we can, a lot more calories because their metabolism is so high. They just constantly need to feed to stay active. But at night when they can't feed, then they have an adaptation where they go into torpor, especially in cold climates, where the birds will slow their metabolism down so that they don't run out of gas before the next morning. Do swans mate for life? Yes, swans do mate for life. They are an example of a monogamous bird that mates for life, as do albatrosses. But again, that is not the rule in the bird world, not the, not the main breeding system in the bird world. Any other hummingbird pollination questions? What gives the hummingbird the ability to move their wings so fast? Uh, well, their, their muscles and their metabolism are evolved for that. And they also have a very special way of flapping that's not found in other birds. They actually move their wings in a figure eight position, kind of a back and forth rowing. It's, I, I can't really describe it. If we were face to face, I could kind of move my arms in the right way but it's more of a, uh, it's hard to describe. I'm sure there are some videos out there like that, but it's a figure eight motion and it occurs really rapidly, many, many times per second. And that's what allows hummingbirds to fly in all directions, backwards, forward, straight up, straight down, as well as hover in place for a long time. If you light up a feeder at night, will they come to feed? Uh, I don't think so. I've never heard of that happening. They generally go to sleep at night to conserve energy. But if you are feeding a hummingbird during the winter time and you wanna keep the feeder from freezing over during cold temperatures, then you can get a, a heat lamp and shine it on the feeder or get one of those like warming pads like you have for candles and keep that under the feeder and that helps keep it from freezing. Uh, so when the hummingbird wakes up first thing in the morning, it's got nectar there for it. Either that or you take your feeder down at night and you put it up first thing in the morning so it's ready to go for the birds. But really hummingbirds are tough buggers and they can tolerate cold climates because they can go into torpor. And if you think about it, there are hummingbirds that live at high elevations, and there are hummingbirds like the rufous hummingbird that breed in Alaska, where even in the summertime, it gets cold every night. 
what's the most common migration pattern of hummingbirds? Well, uh, probably most of them go from the Western United States down through Mexico and into Central and Southern America. But the, the ruby-throated hummingbirds, they cross the Gulf of Mexico. And so they fly nonstop for a few days over the Gulf of Mexico and make it to the U Yucatan Peninsula before continuing on, which is why it's so important to have food for these birds along both sides of their migration over the Gulf. And not just feeders, but also plants. Again, native plants are really good for hummingbirds. And so are the native plants in our yard, help fuel their migration when they're coming from the northern US and Canada and heading down towards the Gulf and beyond. What bird has the longest migration of all birds? That would be the Arctic tern going between the Arctic and the Antarctic every year. But also there's the, I believe the bar-tailed curlew that goes between Alaska and Australia every year. It goes from Alaska to Hawaii, Hawaii to Australia, Australia to, the, uh, to Japan and that area, and then back up to Alaska. And it also flies over the open ocean for up to eight days straight. Great questions, everyone. I really appreciate your time and attention. We'll call it quits here. Uh, oh, how long do hummingbirds live? Uh, probably just a few years. They're, they're short-lived birds because they're, you know, live fast, die young kind of thing. I don't know like the longevity record on, off the top of my head, but really most birds, well, most birds don't live to see their first birthday because it's dangerous being a bird and a lot of young birds don't make it. They die for various reasons. And once a bird makes it to his first birthday, its survival rate is pretty good. And smaller birds tend to have shorter lives than bigger birds. And yes, uh, a, a migrating bird can go without food for eight days. It just fattens up. It can double its body weight or more and then set out and migrate. <clears throat> Birds are amazing and they are just very different creatures from us in many different ways. Feeding, sleeping, traveling, all sorts of things. All right, folks, well, I'm going to call it quits here. Uh, again, this has been recorded. It's going to be available on Audubon Arkansas's website, as well as our YouTube page. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate your time and go get your hummingbird feeders up.